right, we're going to begin here in Genesis chapter number 27, verse number 1. Dive right into it. The Bible reads, verse number 1, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son, and said unto him, My son! And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now, a couple of things I'd like to point out just quickly, briefly, in the first couple of verses. Number one, oftentimes in the Bible, this is just a common theme for you to watch out for. You'll see people, when they get very old in the Bible, one of the very first things that will happen is that they will begin to lose their eyesight. Now, I'm going to point out something if I get to it near the end of that ties in with that. Number one. Number two... We see something slight there, just the obedience. Very small and concise, but we see the obedience of Isaac's son Esau. He calls him and then he answers, Behold, here am I. Now I'm going to be, uh, the theme, if I had to have one, for this particular chapter is going to be about parenting. And about the relationship that a parent, each individual parent, has with their children. The relationship that a father has with his children. The relationship that mothers have with their children. And then also, the relationship that the father and the mother both have with one another together with their children, in regards to their children. You'll see why here in just a moment. Verse number two, the other thing that I wanted to point out, notice he says this, and he said, Behold now, I am old, I know not the day of my death. <clears throat> what comes to mind to me here is, number one, how short life is, and no one ever knows the day of their death. And how you see that he is getting ready to make preparations for death. Now, number one, the very first preparation that anyone should make is salvation, of course. Everyone should make sure that they're ready for the day of their death in regards to salvation. Amen. Today is the day of salvation, right? right? And we should treat this way with all of our family members as well, especially those that are getting older. Of course, they're, they're getting closer to death no matter how you slice it, right? <clears throat> Of course, there could be freak accidents, but by and large, they're much closer to death than you are and other younger people are. So those that you have that are loved ones, you need to reach out to them before what happens to everyone comes upon them, which is death, of course. We need to make preparations for death, not only for salvation, also for our, our children, and that's what we see here. There needs to be preparation made for our children. We need to leave them an inheritance. Uh, it, specifically, the main inheritance you need to leave, leave them is a spiritual inheritance, it's an inheritance that they can follow. You need to be, and this is something that that you lead them as an example over their entire lifetime while they're living with you. Look at verse number three. <clears throat> now, therefore, take I pray thee thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison. Now, venison, of course, is it's deer. It's the word. It is the counterpart to, of beef. So you wouldn't call a deer venison. Just like you wouldn't necessarily call a cow beef unless you're talking about the food. That's what venison means. You wouldn't just call it a deer that's running around like, hey, look at that venison, right? Just like you wouldn't walk up to a cow and say, hey, there's the beef. It's referring to the meat of a deer that's ready for food or that's being spoken of in the context of food. That's what venison is specifically. The meat of a deer that's going to be eaten. Look at verse 4. And make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Now, a couple of things I want to point out too, real quickly, just small points here in the very beginning, is Isaac doesn't die for a very long time. There's a, a, an extremely, I, I can't remember exactly uh, if you actually do the math, I've never actually calculated it, but many years go by. He thinks he's on his deathbed, literally, right? He like, is like, bring me this food so that I can consume it, and then bless you, and then die. So he thinks he could be dying you know, any day, or, or at least even that day. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> and Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold... I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. <clears throat> now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, 
such as he loveth. Verse 10, And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. So even Rebecca thinks Isaac's going to die. So he's obviously in very bad condition. He's obviously in bad health. He's to the point now where his eyes are very dim here in a moment. We're going to see that he cannot even discern between uh, you know, his two own sons when they walk in. <clears throat> He's, he's in a very bad physical, you know, natural state at this point. Now, a couple of things I want to point out to kind of launch us into the story is we have a situation here where Rebecca goes to her son. She hears, of course, uh, when Isaac is speaking to his son Esau, he says, Hey, go make me the, you know, the savory meat such as I love of the venison. I want you to go get it and bring it back to me, and I'm going to eat it. And I'm going to bless you, and then I'm going to die. Well, Rebecca overhears this. And who's Rebecca's favorite son? Isaac. Jacob. Right, Jacob. And so he goes, she goes behind her husband's back and does what? She tells Jacob about what's getting ready to happen. And she explains to him, and then she does what? She, if you're paying attention, <clears throat> she conjures up, or she devises a plot to do what? To, to, to steal the blessing... That, that's, that's true, but what I'm getting at is to deceive her own husband. Now, a lot of relationships are this way. This is one thing I want to point out. This is one thing I want you to keep in your mind a lot. Where one parent will favor the children more than they do the other spouse. This happens very, very often. And this oftentimes ends up being the breaking point in a relationship. I want you to look up divorce statistics when you walk out of here. If you get a chance, you'll notice very common for people to get divorces when their children move out. You know why? Because one of the one of the spouses were only there because their children were there. And because the, the, the true bond of their relationship was not with the husband and the wife, it was rather one of them at least with their child with their child or children, however many it is. But when the last child leaves specifically, not just one of the children, but when the last child leaves and then it's me and you that's left there, it's very common. <clears throat> the percentages are very high. It's one of the most common situations when people get divorces. You know why? Of course, the reason is because, like as I said before, that they ne the, the one spouse, maybe both, the one spouse cares more about their children than they do the other spouse. Now, that ought not ever be that way. And it doesn't even make sense logically. And that's a perfect example of it because your children aren't going to be there forever, right. but your spouse is. Amen. Your child's not going to be there for the rest of your life, but your husband or your wife is going to be there the rest of your life. This is the, you know, this is the, the circle of, 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 the, of marriage. The way that it works is your children are, are going to move out, and they're going to go, and they're going to get married and move in with someone, right? Whether it's uh, you know, one of your sons, they're going to move in with a woman that they marry. If you have a daughter, she's going to move in with a man that she marries. <clears throat> you should never, the, chil the children need to know this when they grow up, you should never, never put your children above your, your spouse. Amen. That should never happen. Your spouse should be number one. Amen. Your spouse, your husband or your wife should be number one over your children. That's just a fact. That, that is the way that God has designed. It's father, mother, Children. This is the way it works as far as the authority structure in the family. So there should never be a time when the mother goes behind the father's back and has the children lying to the to the father. That's very, very evil. That's extremely wicked. And even the thought of that makes me angry. Even if it's the opposite, that is not right. Right. <laughs> the father goes behind the child's back and the mother, let's say there's a situation where the father, the, the father would never have done this because, of course, the, the father is the authority in the home. But let's say this, that there's, there's a specific situation where the father knows that something is not. I keep looking up there because that red light is never usually on. I haven't noticed it before and I keep seeing it. The father, where the father maybe would have never done this before. With the you know with the mother around, maybe it's something that's sinful. Maybe it's something that's just you know something that he says that he wouldn't do. Whatever it may be. But when the mother leaves, he takes the child and then he goes and does whatever it is. Takes them somewhere. I'm I'm not saying anything horribly wicked, but I'm just saying it's maybe something that the mother disapproves of or something that that isn't right to do. And then he gets the child to lie to the mom. This kind of stuff happens all the time. 
or the mother, or, or let's say the father makes rules in the household and says, hey, don't do this. <clears throat> and then what's going on during the day is exactly what he said, don't do. And the kids are doing this all day, and then the mother tells the kids, hey, when your dad gets home, don't tell him that I allowed you to do that. That's wicked as hell. Yeah. That is super evil. Amen. That should never be going on. You know what's going to happen is it's going to cause your children to look down upon their father, or it's going to cause your children to look down upon the mother. That's what's going to happen, one way or the other. It's going to cause them to, and then number, and then also uh, it's going to uh, uh, relate, uh, put in them, <clears throat> it's going to embed in them just the spirit of deceit. What you, what you see happening right here is, is Rebecca teaching Jacob how to deceive other people. Now, that's one of the things I, wanted, I, want you to, I want you to keep in your mind while we're going through here. But the other thing I want to point out is this. This is very interesting. First, let me, let me ask you, let me explain something else before I go into that point. If you look at verse 8, it says, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Now, should children obey their parents? Yeah. They should obey their parents. They 100% should obey their parents, right? But let me ask you this question. If your parents tell you to do something sinful, then should children obey their parents? They should not. Jacob should not have obeyed Rebecca in this situation. What Rebecca was teaching Jacob to do, or coercing her to do, or I'm sorry, him to do, was to lie and to deceive and to sin against his own father. And in a situation where a parent is commanding a child to be disobedient to God, that's not okay. The Bible says that we ought to obey God rather than man. And that includes parents. God is the top authority. That we have other authorities in our life, but God trumps all. So if God says something and someone else says something else, whether it be police, whether it be president, whether it be any sort of authority, parents, if they contradict God, you always go with God. Amen. You always go with what God commands you to do. Amen. So in this situation... Jacob should have disobeyed Rebecca because Rebecca was commanding him to do something that was sinful. In any other case, parents need the only exception for children to disobey parents. I don't even like to word it that way, just because of very young children. But the only exception when a, when a child should not listen to their parent is when they are, the parent that is, commanding them to do something that is against God. That's the only time ever. Look at verse 9 now. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence to get good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. Now, let me explain something to you, too, that just because Calvin was on my mind, because people are commenting on that video, and brother all was talking about it earlier. Um, let me explain something to you, too. So many people will say that that God you know, uh, uh, you know, predestines or chooses people from the very beginning of course, maybe to be uh, saved or, uh, or, or someone to be damned and not saved, right? <clears throat> now, God will have plans. God will have specific plans, and, and especially the plan of salvation and everything that ties in with that and the Messiah to come, right? So God had a plan that <clears throat> of one line, of a specific line, that there would be the Messiah, right? That was, that was for sure. That was 100%, right? Now, there's the birthright, and then there is the blessing. Esau had the birthright, and he chose of his own free will to give up the birthright, didn't he? Well, the blessing is specifically, and they're, they're, they're not the same thing. They, you, know, you can think of them as being closely related, but they're not the same thing. The blessing is specifically what comes from God that's being passed down from Abraham, Isaac, and then it ends up, in this case, going to Jacob. When you look at Genesis chapter 26... Oh, I'm sorry, 25, I guess it is. Yeah, Genesis 25, we see where God is speaking to Rebecca. Now, in the, the whole scheme of things, I do not believe that God is foreordaining specifically Jacob to be. And, and people may disagree with this, but I'll tell you why in just a moment. I do not believe that God, that God himself is foreordaining or predestining in the sense of that he's choosing that Jacob's line will be the line as opposed to Esau. When we read here in Genesis 25, 23, I believe that this is him just revealing a truth of what will end up happening. 
So if you look there in verse number 23, this is all that it says. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, that's just him revealing the truth is all that's happening. I'll tell you why I don't believe that God is manipulating these things. Because how does it end up coming to fruition from chapter 27? Through deceit. Is God the author of sin? Does God take part in sin at all? Now, God could have been revealing the truth because of he knew how Rebecca was going to get her way somewhere or another. Because why did it happen in the first place? Because Jacob was Rebecca's favorite. So she, I believe, in this case, what it seems to be, she would have found a way in order for Jacob to have received this blessing and these types of things of the birthright and that. Obviously, he stole the birthright, but she probably would have worked that out as well because she obviously favors her younger, you know, her younger son. I always mess with my dad because I'm the second born. My brother, and, you know, if he ever says anything about him being the first born for like joking around, I'd be like, yeah, you know, but uh, uh, Ishmael was also the first born, and as was Esau. So the second born is like Jacob, and the second born is, uh, of course, um, Isaac. So, but here we see the we see the uh, Rebecca, the mother, trying to get her own son to lie to the father. Now, I don't believe that God is the author of that. I don't believe that God is working in this and He's tweaking these types of things. Because you know what you have to believe then that God is the author of sin. That's ultimately what it comes down to. You have to believe that God is the one that is persuading, you know, Rebecca to do this or. Or God is the one that is that is uh, uh, you know guiding these <clears throat> uh, circumstances, if you will, to this point. And what is the the mobile? What is you know the transportation that's getting them there? Who be who be the line? Right. I don't believe that. I don't buy that for a second. So just wanted to point that out quickly, just because that was on my mind. People are commenting and, and things. We were talking about that earlier, discussing that. Look at verse number ten. <clears throat> and thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat. And that he may bless thee before his death. Verse 11. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. And I am a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me. And I shall seem to him as a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be, be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go Fetch me them. Now, <clears throat> what does Rebecca look like right now? A lot of times we look at Jacob in a very dim light, which of course him being an accomplice, it's wicked what he did. But how does Rebecca look right now? She's actually the author of all of this. She's the one that is manipulating even Jacob, where he's like, hey, I'm not sure if I should do this. This may turn out bad. And then she's just sitting there just continually persuading him you know, to go through with this. Not only that, something that's interesting is... <clears throat> Of course, the blessing was going to come. There were certain things, like I just mentioned, where God was, His hand was guiding it. He was, He was, uh, you know, sending specific details down uh, the line of what He wanted it to be the outcome of the line of the Messiah. But also, we can see that there is majorly an aspect of human volition, of human will, because when we see what's going on here, what ends up, what is the outcome from? I mean. In this case, Isaac is just going to bless. And as we know, of course, the story, everyone here, he's going to bless whoever comes in there, isn't he? Do you know what that tells you? Is That just shows you so much, you know, of course, further disproving Calvinism, how God leaves so much into the hands of man. How God gave this blessing. Of course, he has certain aspects of it that will be, you know, that will be within these limits. There will be a Messiah that comes. There will be a nation that's born. The law will be given to them and there will be a light in the Gentiles. But, I'm giving this blessing to Abraham and he's going to give it to his children. <coughs> and then Isaac's going to give it to his children. And he gives so much free will to them in this regard that one of them is even able to come in <coughs> and deceive the father in the blessing of that just shows the, the amount of free will that God does give. It's an interesting thought, but that's actually what's happening here. So we need to make sure that we understand how all this is working together. And of course, our starting point is God's not the author of sin. We understand that. We can see that many times in the Bible. In Him it, you know, is no darkness. The Bible says that in Him is light and no darkness, right? Look, at, uh, look again at verse number 
14. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took good, goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. This tells us right here how hairy Esau really was. Look at the next verse. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats, that's a younger goat, upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. So that tells you, it shows you how hairy Esau really was, where the imitation of e Esau's hair is literally replaced or substituted with the hair of a goat, where she shaves it off, or cuts the skin off at least, and puts that on him, and that is how he feigns himself to be uh, <clears throat> Esau. That's crazy. Yeah. Either that or stinking Isaac is out of his mind. He's so he looks like he's about to die. You know, one of the two. And he's just feeling like his go there. Verse seventeen. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father. I am Esau, thy firstborn. That's, that's wicked. That's extremely evil. We look over these things. You know what it says? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. That's evil. Right. That's it. We look over things like this. We read things like that. But that is not right. Of course, he ends up receiving the blessing by deceiving his own father. And you know he, he get you know sometimes things can work out for you in certain regards. You see some of the some of the kings, and you don't receive the punishment right away. Or if you overall you know you live a pretty good life, God will just kind of look at your life and He'll certain, let certain things go in your life. But very often times, saved people when they commit sins like this, they will be punished severely. And when we look at uh, uh, examples of people in the Bible. Even if someone's not punished or it seems like they get away with it, don't go try that yourself. That's the point I'm getting to. Don't go see what happens because I can give you scores of examples of people that did disobey authorities, if you will, and they received serious punishments. God, God is a just God. And he knows all the ins and outs and every... He has perfect equity when he looks down at someone's life. You don't. You don't know the whole situation. What Jacob did here is wicked. Whether he ended up getting away with it to some degree, or uh, and that's not even exactly the way, whether it appears to us, let me word it that way. Whether it appears to us that he got away with it to some degree, I'm positive that God weighed things out. And he, was, he was recompensed for what he did here. <clears throat> so don't let examples like that in the Bible persuade you or coerce you into doing something wrong. Look at verse, uh, uh, verse number... 19, the end there, so pick up right after firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, <clears throat> I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. It's not venison either. It's goat. He's just lying, of course, to him over and over again. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, look at this, because the Lord thy God brought it to me. That is wicked as hell. Right. Where he's bringing God into this matter and he's saying, you know how I got this father? This is Esau. The Lord delivered him to me. Here he. That's extremely wicked. Right. Sometimes you read these stories and you just read over them because we know all the great things that Jacob did later. This is extremely wicked. Right. And especially bringing God into it. You know what it makes him? A false prophet is what it makes him. I'm going to tie something in with that in just a moment. Look at verse 21. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee. That I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. Now, does it seem like he's just believing everything he's saying? Or that he's skeptical? He's definitely skeptical, isn't he? That's why he says at the very beginning, <clears throat> he said, And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? So he's skeptical of what's going on. And then he tells him, Hey, come here, let me test this out. Verse 22, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he's made himself look like Esau, feel like Esau. Look at verse 23. And he discerned him not because his hands were hairy, as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. So that was the result of it. So <clears throat> look at verse 24. 
And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. So he, he digs his feet in into the deceit even more. Verse 25, and he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat. <clears throat> and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. It's like uh, you have a slight picture there of what Judas did to Jesus, where he comes near and he kisses him. He says, My son, just like what is Jesus called? Uh, Judas, when he betrays him, my friend. <clears throat> Look at verse 27. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Now, what we have a perfect picture of here, and it's, and it's, it's uh, ideal, it lines up, I mean, to a T when he starts actually saying that the Lord has blessed him, is we have a picture of a false prophet. And we can find counsel or advice here. When he comes in, based upon his words or based upon his voice, how does it sound to Isaac? Good or bad? Bad. When he bases it upon his words. But then, he says, hey, feel my arm. So based upon his feelings, how is it? It's good. And I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 13. When he eats the food, how is it? What's the appearance of that? The way it tastes, all the other feelings. It's pretty much the same, right? But is it the same? It's not the same, is it? What does uh, what is meat oftentimes in the Bible? In the New Testament specifically, or doctrine, isn't it? What you have is a picture of a false prophet going and, and speaking in the name of the Lord. His words are right. He, he, he serves the meat and it looks right, it sounds right, right? It, it maybe smells right. It's got, he, he looks right, his appearance looks right. But his voice, his words, what's the problem? It doesn't sound right. There's something wrong. Now let me say this too. <clears throat> That's the key right there, my friend. If you ever want to test a false prophet, you don't look at his appearance. You don't look at how he sounds. You don't look at, oh, he looks like an independent fundamental Baptist. You know, he has Baptist on the wall, but he sounds like a Pentecostal, right? <laughs> You see, you don't, that's not the things that you go after. What you go after, what you need to test it with is the voice. What you need to go with are the words. And many times people get caught up in their feelings. Well, you know, when I see them, it looks right. The music all sounds right. All these other things, they line up with the way that a true prophet would sound. But what do you do? You need to try the spirits to see whether they are of God. How do you do that? You test the words. If Esau, or I'm sorry, if Isaac would have based his words, the, his voice, if he would have based everything on the voice of the words, what would have happened? He said, you're not my son. You're not my son. It's the same exact thing with Judas coming to Jesus. Obviously, in the sense of you have him being a false prophet. Right? <coughs> you, you, we need to base things on people's words we need to base things on their voice on what we hear what's coming out of their mouth look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 look at verse number 13 for such are false apostles deceitful workers does that sound familiar? transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to the works. Now, don't misunderstand me. Jacob, I do not believe, is, is a damnable heretic. But Jacob is a perfect picture of how a false prophet deceives. He has an intent to deceive. He has an intent to plant wickedness or some sort of deception in the hearts of people. And you know what he does? He dresses up or he transforms himself into a minister of light. What did Jacob do? Transformed himself. But do you know how you can peg a false prophet every time? It's not by the way they look. 
It's the words that come out of their mouth. Right. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Amen. The way that you can tell whether someone is a false prophet or not is by the words that they speak. Right. You do not allow your heart, you do not allow your feelings, you don't base it upon the way something smells, whether you enjoy the music, all of those types of things. You need to try their words. You need to test their words. That's what everything should be based upon, is the word. And what does it line up with? Does it line up with the word of God? So what we have there is a perfect picture of how a false prophet comes in and he attempts to deceive someone. Go back now to Genesis chapter number 27. Genesis chapter number 27. We'll keep reading the story. Genesis chapter number 27. <coughs> it says this, verse number, where do we leave off to 26? Look at verse 27. No, we, we read verse 27. Look at verse 28. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. I'm not going to go back over this, but if you remember in the book of Ruth, chapter number 2, uh, I showed you that corn in the Bible is oftentimes, I believe almost every time, bread. It's referring to like, a, 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 it, it, it's in its wheat form. Uh, Jesus said, like in the New Testament, he said, uh, corn of wheat falls to the ground. So that right there is one alone, but it's referring to it in like a raw or natural form of a seed. Oftentimes you'll see just like here, <clears throat> corn and wine coupled together. That's bread and wine. Bread and like grape juice, right? I don't think I pointed this out, but when Melchizedek comes, what does he bring? And this is relevant because we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper. He brings corn and wine, it says, right? It may even say bread, actually, but bread and wine. That's Jesus bringing, of course, a, this is a picture of the Lord's Supper, bread and wine, and what we consume. And of course, he is the high priest, that is Jesus himself. Look at verse number uh, 29 now. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Now that is the blessing of Abraham that he just received. That's being passed out from person, person to person. Look at verse 30. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob. <clears throat> and Jacob was yet scarce. That means just barely, just a second ago. Gone out from the presence of Isaac, his, his father. That Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father, and said unto his father, Let my father arise, and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac his father said unto him, <coughs> Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. Now look at verse number 33, how his initial reaction is. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly. <coughs> You know how he knew that? Because he knew something was wrong with the words and the voice when he heard Jacob come in there. Because immediately when, I, when, when Esau actually comes in, he speaks. Does he question whether this is Esau or not? No, but he knows now that he heard Esau's voice. voice just like our children. Then once he, once he heard Esau's voice, then what? It, say, it doesn't say that he did, he... did he confirm it or verify it? No, it says... Immediately, he trembled exceedingly, right? He trembled very exceedingly. He knew immediately once he had heard his voice. He should have went off of the words. And said, who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him. And then he says this, yea, and he shall be blessed. You know what that means? What's done is done. That can be scary when you look at that in life. What's done is done. That's what that means. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. Every time I read that, I see people standing before God. Every time I read that, and I just, I just picture Esau, it just like, there's like this double picture that pops into my mind of a person like standing before God. Because you see that, that Esau is like, he's just extremely desperate. And there's no hope. There's no hope. What's done is done. And he's standing before his father, right? 
and he's begging him, just please. And there's going to be a lot of this, of course, at the Day of Judgment. Many people that had many opportunities to be saved, they had opportunities to hear the gospel, and they came in maybe, or maybe to even hear someone give it to them, and they knocked it on their door. And this is the way that everyone's going to react. This is the way that everyone that rejected the gospel. There will be no one that's haughty. There will be no one that's lofty. Right. It won't happen. The Bible talks about how he's going to bring all of that low. Right. So everybody stands before him. I don't care if it's Richard Dawkins. I don't care all these people that are like the most proud people that walk this planet. When they stand before God, they are going to bow their knee. And they are going to confess, you are Lord, Jesus. Amen. You are the Lord. Amen. Right. And they're going to cry with a very exceedingly bitter cry of what's going to happen. And they're just going to scream out and just ask for forgiveness. Please, please, I'll do whatever I have to do. Nope. What's done is done. I already blessed him. You don't get another opportunity. You had your chance. It's over. This is kind of an idea that people today struggle with. You know, uh, in our society, people think you should always keep giving people second chances repeatedly. That's not biblical. There comes a time where it's like, hey, you know, especially with God, I've given you enough opportunities. <laughs> Even in this life sometimes. No more opportunities. That's it. What's done is done. Verse 35, and he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. God's not the author of that, my friend. God's not the one that's, that's, that is, uh, you know, bringing this to its... God, God is not, you know, the one that's conjuring all of this up. And, and this isn't in God's mind. And this is the method that I want to use. And, and that's a very strange thought. But this, if you're a Calvinist, that's what you have to believe. That God is the one that is orchestrating and coordinating all of these events. And he is the one that is using deceit to get his way. Because that's what they believe about the way in which uh, Jacob became the promised child of the blessed one. Look at verse 36. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? <clears throat> For he hath supplanted me these two times. That's what Jacob means, is supplanted or deceived. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said... Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, he's like, I'm going to read this, it's almost like he's rubbing it in. Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? That's sad, man. That's, that's powerful. He's telling him, I gave him everything already. It's too late. What do I have left to give you? That's what he's asking. You tell me, what do I have left to bless you with? Look at verse 38. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So you can see him before the twice. said, I always picture people standing before God. As you can see, he is like, he is just distraught. He is. He's desperate. He's screaming out. He's like, is there any way? And he's like, no. Is there any way? No. Just anything at all? No. That's how it's going to be. That's why I want to put that thought in your mind. That's scary. So you need to knock doors now. You need to go out and, and, and give people the gospel Amen. now. Amen. Right. <clears throat> Take it serious. If that's what it takes to motivate you, is the, you know, is the the possible torment of others, that's a perfect, that's a perfect motivation. Right. Pull people out of the fire. That's right. While they're in the middle of screaming, pull them out of the fire, right? Mm -hmm. That's a scary thing. Who wants to stand before family members while they're standing before your God and your Savior and someone you never even gave the gospel to and they're just screaming out? Imagine a family member. Maybe someone close to you that you never gave the gospel to, and they are just screaming on their knees. It doesn't matter whether they reject Christ today. I'm saying this is going to happen. And they stand before God, and you're standing there alongside the God of the universe and your Savior, and they're just on their knees begging and screaming, Please! No. Please! No. Just please, one more chance! No. It's not happening. No. That's how God is. 
He's a God of justice. That's justice. You know, that, that should sadden your heart to a degree. Get them the gospel, whoever that may be. Someone popped into your mind. You need to, I'm sure in everyone's mind, someone popped in. The next week or two, give that person the gospel. Go to them and try to speak with them about the gospel. Especially, just like I mentioned earlier, Isaac, what's happening? He's getting near the end of his life. Maybe that person you thought of was getting near, near the end of their life. When they die, you know, there's two choices, my friend. <clears throat> Heaven or hell. That's it. There's a real hell burning beneath our feet. I know there's a, 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 a sermon illustration I've heard many times where <clears throat> I remember specifically my pastor preached a really good sermon one time. He was talking about if I had a shovel and if it was possible to just take that shovel and just start digging right here in front of the pulpit. I'm just digging and digging. He said, and I'm just not even preaching to you, but it was possible for me to pull this ground up and you can look down into hell. How much soul would you do then? Think about that. If you could peer down into it, really see in reality what's going on in hell, and like the rich man screaming out, people just, everyone just, real personalities, real people. One person screaming for a drop of water, another person screaming for their grandmother, another person screaming for their child, one person's confused. These are real minds and people that are really burning in hell right now for the sins that they have committed. Get people the gospel. Amen. Get them the gospel. Amen. Look at the next verse there. <clears throat> verse number 39. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. He's telling him he's going to live, live a rough life. That's what he's telling him. He's not going to receive a blessing. And by thy sword shalt thou live. He's saying he's going to have to survive by defending himself his entire life. It's obviously not. You, no one wants to... There's two, there's two categories of life. Blessing and cursing. And it's also like this. War and peace. War is not a blessing. War is a cursing. Like Solomon's days, you know, he had, he was blessed, and there was peace during that time. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. Is, he, is Edom or Esau, the the nation of Esau is gonna is going to be living because uh, all these, of course, pass down to their descendants. This is a blessing that's going down to their descendants. They're going to be living in, in constant warfare. <clears throat> That's what you read about when you read about it in the Bible as well. It says afterwards, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have, have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Verse 41, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. I also see Jacob and Esau as a picture of the true Israel and the physical Israel as well. It's very similar to Ishmael, which is an allegory, of course. Ishmael... And um, Isaac, isn't it? Very similar. One despises the other, mistreats the other. Here we see him hating him, right? Um, you, you know, it's, it's almost, you see this again with uh, Cain and Abel, right? Remember where one hates the other, one's of that wicked one. It's found in 1 John, where the wicked one's talked about. But also the other thing that's talked about a lot in the book of 1 John is the spirit of Antichrist. And who is the spirit of Antichrist? The Jews. You know, hand in hand, those two things are very similar. So you see, the two sons here, like like Cain and Abel, uh, like uh, excuse me, my mind keeps slipping. Like uh, who is it? Ishmael and Isaac. Man, Ishmael and Isaac, and then as we see here, Jacob and no, I'm just kidding, Esau. <clears throat> who is a picture of? Physical Israel. And spiritual Israel. That's what I see here. When I read these battles with brothers and things like that, I oftentimes see that how the one hates the other one. He's persecuting him, or he wants to, right? What happened with Cain and Abel? He persecutes him. What happened with Ishmael and Jacob, or Isaac, I'm sorry, he persecutes him. This is a picture of physical Israel and spiritual Israel. <clears throat> Look at the next verse. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. So it's making himself feel better, the fact that he has a plot in his mind to kill his brother. That's wicked, right? 
that's extremely evil. Even if your brother does you wrong or steals something from you, you shouldn't desire to kill your brother. That's horrible. But it's making him, he's comforting himself, it's making him feel better, the thought of just killing his brother. Verse 43, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Aram. I want to stop right there, and this is something I told you to pick back up, and I've talked about at the beginning, is this theme of the relationship between a mother and her children, or the father and her children, and one of the, one of the spouses going around the other spouse's back. We can see that further here, where she's going to her son, like, hey, Esau's trying to kill you now, and then where does she say she's going to send him? It's, isn't it funny? To her in-law's house. You see these kind of situations happen today, all the time, where one spouse is siding with her in-laws, or, or I'm sorry, not her, in not her in-laws, her family, not in-laws. It would be his in-laws, right? <clears throat> to her family's house. She say, hey, you need to go to my family's house, right? To protect yourself from Esau. This is what you see oftentimes in relationships as well, is where <clears throat> the the maybe your in-laws or your parents, whichever side you're on of this, will step into a discussion or will step into a conversation that maybe two spouses are having about their children, right? A husband and a wife, they're discussing how something's going to be dealt with, or maybe maybe even your parents or one of the parents are, are around, the in-laws are around, or your parents are around, and they see something taking place that they disagree with, and they try to get into the conversation, they try to inject themselves and their opinions into the conversation. I'm not a fan of that ever happening, <clears throat> ever. I don't, tell, I don't care what you think at all. I think it's terrible when in-laws or parents get involved in parenting. Amen. Horrible. I think that they have no... It's, the Bible says that the that man, you know, they're supposed to leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife. You know, the man is supposed to leave his father and mother. They're not there anymore. And cleave unto his wife. The parents are out of the picture at that point. They're left already. They're gone. You understand? Oftentimes in the Bible, people will pack up and totally leave you know, a, a, a particular land and leave their family behind. And this sometimes is God's will. Right. It's, it's your parents should never be. And you know what? If your in-laws or your parents try to give you opinions, you honestly need to tell them in a very nice way, <clears throat> hey, I appreciate if you have good intentions, I appreciate what you're trying to do. But these are our children, and we're going to raise them how we want to, and you're just going to cause more problems. Please stay out of disciplining. Or please stay out of our parenting. Word it that way. But it may not be just disciplining. Sometimes, you know, it's not all oh, you spanked them and they got mad or something like that. Please stay out of, you know, us parenting our children. And, there, and <clears throat> if this continues to happen, you need to explain to them that they, they can't be around. This is how I am, at least. You take, you know, you take my advice if you want. This is, of course, just the pastor giving his personal advice. But let me tell you this. You know what else is way high up on statistics as far as divorce? It's like one of the number one things. Family members getting involved in relationships. That's what causes in-laws or your family members, you know, uh, 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 injecting themselves into conversations and giving their opinions, or maybe going behind their back, kind of like in this kind of situation where now what does Rebecca do? Go to my brother's house in Haran. Right? That shouldn't be happening. <clears throat> the husband and the wife, they're, your best friend husband should be your wife, and your best friend wife should be your husband. It shouldn't be your mom, Amen. ladies. It shouldn't be your dad. Men, that shouldn't be your best friend. Your wife should be your best friend. Your husband should be your best friend. And you shouldn't like be speaking about all these private things behind your husband's back or speaking about all these private things behind your wife's back. It should not be happening. Right. It creates a rift in the relationship. You should, the most important thing, or the most important person outside of God to a man should be his wife. And the most important person outside of God to a woman should be her husband. That's how it should be. If you want to have a healthy relationship, that's what you should do. If you don't want to have a healthy relationship, then do the opposite. And, and you can look at all the people in the Bible. 
They always have family issues every time as far as priorities. When they have family issues, it's always like some sort of priority issue. That should be your priority. It should be God, and then your spouse, and then your children. It shouldn't be God, and then your in-laws, or your, your, your particular parents, if it's you, I'm sure. <clears throat> or And then your children, and then your spouse. You're going to end up getting a divorce later in life, then, sadly. That's what will happen. I promise you that's what will happen. I mean, it's like, I think it's third or fourth on statistics, maybe fourth, on statistics uh, of divorce rates is uh, issues with parents injecting themselves. It might even be third. And then you look up the, the statistic rate, I think uh, if you expand the statistics, it's like top ten, it's like seven or eight. It's been like a couple years since I looked it up. It's like seven or eight that people will uh, move out because it was because something that has to do with their children. You look deeper into those statistics, it's because the children moved out. You know why? Because the bond truly really wasn't between the husband and wife. There should never, never be a time where you're choosing your children over your spouse, ever. There should never be a time where you're choosing your family over your spouse. It shouldn't happen. Amen. It should not happen. That's one of the major things about this. What Rebecca did, one behind her husband's back, is wicked. Super sinful. And if Isaac would have done the same thing to Rebecca, it still would have been equally, wrong. equally as wrong. It's not right either way. <clears throat> Look what it says there, verse number... 44. It says, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. He doesn't say a few days, obviously. He stays many years. Verse 45. Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him, then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Look at verse 46. <clears throat> and Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these, which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I don't feel very well. <clears throat> so that's kind of why I went faster tonight. But I, I do want to make the last point there. The daughters of Heth, obviously, are the daughters of those that live in Canaan. The people of Canaan, are they, are they righteous and godly people? They're not. So why is she saying this, of course? For that reason, she wants her child to marry, wants uh, Jacob specifically, to marry a righteous woman. We should have the same, you know, uh, desires for our children. All these things, not everything, oftentimes we'll have a theme. It's about the family in this particular chapter. Oftentimes you can learn a lot of things in one particular angle in the context. Make sure, make sure that you're raising your children right today and that men are being a good example to their daughters of what type of husband that she should have. So that's what the, often, and that's uh, many situations like that, you can see where, uh, and you've heard stories I'm sure, where daughters will grow up and they'll marry a man that was like, what? Her dad. Or the opposite. So that's why ladies need to be a good example of, of, a, of a woman that their son <coughs> marry one day, seek to marry one day. So we're example to all of our children in many different angles, in many different aspects. They're, they're, they're watching you constantly. They're always, they're picking up on things that you do. They're saying things that you say. <clears throat> My, Elijah says stinking like every other sentence. <laughs> Jeremiah said earlier today, that is a bunch of stinking ants coming in the house. There's some ants coming under the door. <laughs> Where do you think you get that from? I say stinking all the time, right? A lot of people say it, but yeah. Elijah says it constantly. My sons say constantly. They watch us. They say the things that we say. They do the things that we do. They're going to go the places we go. Are you praying? Are you reading your Bible in front of them? Are you quoting scripture? Right? Amen. These are things they're going to do when they get older. Amen. These are. This is how your children are going to be when they get older. How? Look at yourself. That's how they're going to be. You're their example. You're, you are what they see in every area. So that goes for, it's not only hey, men, men, girls, girls, right? Or women, women. Op the opposite is true as well because they're looking for what they need when they get older. My sons are probably going to marry a woman like my wife. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? That's what's going to happen. So be, who do you, and, and you know what mothers can say is, Am I, am I a good example of who I want my sons to marry? 
And if not, then fix a couple things. Men. Same thing goes to men. Right. Look at your daughters and say, is this, the, am I the type of man that I want my daughters to go and marry? If not, fix a couple things. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> you have me, Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the good examples, and I say always the bad example. We ask you that you would just enlighten our understanding, uh, help us to understand your word, dear God. Help us to, to, to know your character, dear Lord, and who you are. We might serve you better. Greater understand uh, who you are, even even if we feel like we have a grasp, we can always learn more. Dear Lord, we we ask you that you would help us to understand your word more. That people would love to study the Bible, they would enjoy these Bible studies. Uh, we we thank you for the uh, example of, of Jacob here, dear God, and, and of Esau. We ask you that you would be with us and help us to to have a good uh, family, a good family uh, core, dear Lord, and values. And that we would uh, have the right priorities in our life and that we would be good examples to our children, dear Lord. And that uh, spouses would love one another and put each other uh, second right after God. Be with us and bless us and bless our church and help us to build the church here. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.